Well, welcome everyone to today's workshop. Today we're going to be covering an introduction to uh, plotting with the Plotly Python package and an introduction to Dash. And I see here that one participant has uh, about one year experience with Python, mainly for data analysis, familiar with the Pandas library, some experience with Python and Pandas. Swaptat, congratulations. Um, okay, so it sounds like some of you do have some comfort with Python, so that's good. Uh, so the workshop does require a little bit more comfort. Uh, this is not an introductory uh, workshop, so we do require at least some familiarity working with the Python programming language and with the Pandas library, which is great. And um, if I could request to uh, share my screen. And then on the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and share with you a link to the workshop material. Uh, so can we launch the poll? Okay, and so on your screen, you'll see in the meantime that there's a uh, poll and the poll has the questions, are you familiar with Python? Are you familiar with Dash? And are you familiar with Pandas? So we'll go ahead and wait a few moments for people to submit their answers. And how are the answers doing in the poll? Uh, do you want to uh, end the poll? Or I think we have 16 or 80 responses. Okay. Okay. Can you see the results? Yes, I can see the results. So for, are you familiar with Python? So we have 100% of participants said yes. Are you familiar with Dash? 6% said yes and 94% said no. That's fine. We're good. That's what we're here for. We're here to learn Dash. And then are you familiar with Pandas? We have 63% yes and 38% no. That's okay. Uh, so for today, today's workshop, we do use a couple Pandas functions but the workshop does not have a strong component of knowing how or needing to manipulate uh, a Pandas data frame. For those of you who haven't worked with this before, what the Pandas library is, it's a Python package that is specialized for working with the data frame or with data rather. And so within, within uh, Pandas, the key data structure is the data frame which is a collection of information formatted with rows and columns. And typically within this, these rows and columns, we have a series of methods, methods and functions that are um, designed to efficiently manipulate the data. So things that you can do with Pandas includes things like cleaning up your data. Other things that you can do include uh, plotting your data, uh, generating summary statistics. Uh, you can do transformations within your data frame, etc. So it is a fairly powerful and versatile tool. And so we won't be going too, too much into depth, but we'll use a couple functions for today. All right, so let me get started. I'm going to go ahead and do screen share. And so I'm going to go ahead and add the workshop material for today's session. 
All right, so I've added the link on the chat. And so the first thing that I want you to, to do, um, hopefully by now you do have a GitHub account, a Heroku account, and if you don't, uh, that's okay. I do have enough material within the slides to, to make it work. So let's just do a quick poll in the chat. How many of you have a Git account? I'll type yes, if you have a Git account, or if you've worked with GitHub before. Okay, I see a bunch of yeses. Perfect. All right, so then what I'm gonna ask you to do then is to go ahead, Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you then to open up a terminal and then get clone the repository. I'm gonna open up uh, one at the same time and I've added the full command in the chat as well to make it a little bit easier for you. All right, so let me just go ahead and move. I believe I already have it. Yes, I believe I already have uh, dashboard workshop dash. Okay, so I already have a copy in my local computer. Uh, but when you do get clone, you should create a new folder called work dashboard workshop dash. So once you clone it, go to dashboard workshop dash. In there, uh, you should see that there is uh, there is a data folder, an M folder. Uh, well, in your case, you won't see the end folder just yet. Uh, but what you see there is you'll see you have a few notebooks in there. We're going to have, they're going to go through part one and part two today. Uh, you'll see scripts and layouts. Okay, so type ready uh, once you have completed these two steps to clone the repository and to change directories into dashboard workshop dash. I'll wait a few more minutes. Okay, I see one person is already. And if someone is uh, stuck, uh, let me know. And I'm happy to help and do troubleshooting with you. Okay, a couple of folks are ready. Okay. And maybe while folks are downloading or cloning the repository, I can talk a little bit about uh, the schedule for today. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go and do some data exploration and visualization using Jupyter Notebooks. As part of this, we're going to be using the, uh, the Plotly library. Uh, we're going to turn our exploratory code into functions, and I'm going to give an introduction to writing your first Python script. Uh, we're, we're then going to look into dash and layouts and why it's important that we pick a layout before we implement it via code. We're going to play with a few different layouts. We're going to implement the dashboard and test locally. Uh, I'm going to chat a little bit about files necessary to, uh, to deploy. And as a hint, just as a, as a broad overview, typically uh, once we want to host, we can host our dashboard within a GitHub repository similar to this. And some of those important files include a git ignore. In this case, a git ignore is just gonna be uh, taken from um, a template, I'm gonna take the git ignore for Python. Other things that we need are a requirements.txt, uh, typically, this is just a collection of libraries along with the version, and then a proc file, uh, which is going to allow us to, to run the dashboard on an online site. We might not have time to, to, to uh, do it all the way to hosting the dashboard, but what I'll do if we don't have time is I'll give you a few pointers for when you can, or, or way, ways you can uh, deploy your dashboard using a service like Heroku. Provided we get all the way through what one through five, 
and you feel comfortable with playing with your, your dashboard locally, then the next two steps are simply ensuring that you have your, dash host, your dashboard hosted on a GitHub repository, and then from there that you can select a service to do the hosting for you. Okay, so let's just take a look. Okay, looks like most folks are ready. Wonderful. And so for this workshop, I will ask people to work a little bit more on your on your local machine and on your from your terminal. Typically, for some workshops, sometimes I like to prep a little binder button that you can go and have in the in the Jupyter Hub or on a binder service. Uh, but because we do want to get familiar with working with the terminal and setting up environments, I do want you to feel a little bit more more comfortable with this. So the next step, once we have, um, once we have uh, cloned the repository, and once you have ch change directories into dashboard workshop dash, is we want to activate an environment. And the reason for this is, and the, uh, the reason this is super important is one, um, let's just see, I think I have it as Python, I might have it as Python. Okay, the reason this is important is because when we uh, when we develop our dashboard, we want to make sure that we keep track of what libraries and what versions we're using so that when we mo move from the local environment to a cloud based environment, that we keep track of those versions and in general. If you go back to if I, if I if, you, if we go back to the engineering check the engineering check has a requirements.txt. Uh, this file comes, or I, the way I specify this file is by noticing which libraries or which versions I have installed on my local computer, and I, I bring those as part of my environment on the cloud to make sure that there is no bugs introduced by differences in the libraries used. So the next thing we're going to do for that is we're going to activate an environment. So the way we do it is I'm going to do, and um, I believe depending on which machine you're on. If you're working on uh, Mac or Linux, then the way you can activate a virtual environment is via the following two commands. So Python dash M, VNF, ENF. In this case, the name of the environment is gonna be ENF and then and source followed by ENF then activate is gonna activate that virtual environment. If you're working on Windows like I am, then the two commands are as follows. I am and uh, da, 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 da. in this case, it give me an error. So let me just go ahead and try. I might have already set up this in advance. And the yeah, I should already have the and Okay. So I know that my environment is activate, activated once I see this env at the beginning of my, uh, of my command. Before I activated the environment, I start off with base. Uh, this means I'm using my base environment. And then as soon as I run this command env scripts activate, I now have a new environment here. Uh, so I'll ask people to run these two commands if you're on Mac or, Win or, or Linux. Uh, Python dash M VM ENV and then source ENV bin activate or if you're on Windows run these two commands and then the next thing I'm going to ask you to do and it's very very important that, that we are inside dashboard workshop dash is to run a pip install upgrade pip setup tools yep. and why is it <laughs> Um, let me see. This first person is not letting me install it locally. Hmm. Oh, this is not good. Okay. Let me try running it as administrator. Maybe let's do it. Okay, so I needed to run this as administrator. 
Uh, your Windows machine might give you trouble like mine did. I had to run mine from admin as administrator. But from here, I'm going to go do the same thing as before. Okay, so let's go back to the environment. Okay, I am BNB. BNB. It's still not liking it. Hmm. Okay, so that works. No, babe. Okay, uh, so this is definitely gonna be a problem for me if I can't install things. Uh, let me make sure that I have it installed already. Okay, so apparently my machine is giving me trouble today. Um, Okay, so what I'm gonna do in this case is no. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to do the pip install commands while I figure out what's wrong with my machine, and then while you're while it's doing the setup, I'll do troubleshooting on my end. Uh, so first step is activate a virtual environment. Second step is to run pip install, and then type ready environment uh, when that's ready for you. And if you have any issues, let me know. I'm going to go ahead and do troubleshooting on my end. Mm -hmm. Let me just go back to sharing. Um, the screen so you see the commits and I see Okay, so I see one person cannot get the Pi and BNB to work. Pi is not recognized as an internal or external command. Okay, so it looks like you're having a very similar error as I am. So it might have to do with the virtual environment itself. Um, yeah, the same thing. Yeah, so if I go back, let me just stop share and then share my screen. I seem to be having something very similar. If I run pip install upgrade and then pip install requirements within um, within my base environment, that seems to work. But if I do it within the environment, it isn't working. So it might have ha it might have to do with the way I'm setting up the environment. Okay, so let's do the following. Um, if setting up the environment isn't working for you, then what I'm going to ask you to do is to try pip install dash requirements.txt. And then so try the following command on your base environment. Yes, so if you have if you have it on Linux, uh, if you have it on Linux, can you please try python dash m vnv env source and then activate, and then let me know if that works for you. Okay, so that one that one works. Okay, and so when you try to do pip install, does that work for you? And for folks who are just joining in, because uh, I did see a few a few new names trickle in. Uh, the, get, the link to the repository is right here. All we're doing right now is following the setup prep steps. So we have kit clone, we're going to activate the environment, and then from there, we're going to install the requirements. And I only see one, two folks whose environment worked, and then the others. Okay, so it's okay for three. Maybe can we can we run a small poll, or maybe can we do a little bit of a temperature check on the chat? Yes, yes, we can. Now, yeah, one minute. Okay, that sounds good. So, so it's about says... activating the environment, right? Yeah, that sounds good. So I see environment okay on Mac. Pretty successfully because sure pip is not available. 
Right. Okay. Okay, so it sounds like if you're on Ubuntu, then you might need to do sudo might sudo apt get install Python 3 dash VMB. Okay. Okay, so let me just do another temperature check. So if if running the environment fails for you, I um activate and then click install dash r requirements. And then if it's working for you and it's just taking some time, then let it just do its thing. Because sometimes it might take a little bit of, of time to download all the different dependencies. And then once we're good on that part, then we can go ahead and do uh, Jupyter Notebook. But I'll wait, I'll wait a couple more minutes for folks to have their installation completed. Yeah, usually the setup is the most painful part, but I'd rather we spend time together doing it um, than, than rush through the material. So let's just make sure that we'll have the dependencies ready. And then when we have those set up and ready to go, then we can play with the notebooks. And when it's ready for you, it, depending on how long the downloads take, you might see a couple packages being downloaded. Um, okay, and I see most people said yes for the environment. One person said no. Ready for requirement. Okay, awesome. Okay, so for those of you who are ready with the requirements, then the next step is to run Jupyter Notebook. And that should open up a new tab. Let me just go back here. So once your environment is ready, And that should open up a new tab. And I am aware that we have about 20, 21 participants, but only seven have participated in the poll. So I'm wondering if the other, the other 14 uh, would prefer to not, to not um, download the requirements and then just watch for now, or if you're having difficulties with setting up Okay, so see one more person is ready. And one more person just joined. All right. Okay. So what I can do then is I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the next piece. 
And then if someone would like to stay afterwards to troubleshoot or, or, or debug the setup, I'm very, very happy to stay afterwards. Okay, and then so for those for those of you whom the environment didn't work uh, within your base environment. Okay, so for those of you whose whose uh, environment didn't work, uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, type in the chat what piece failed. Was it uh, setting up the environment or activating the environment? And then if it failed at the pip install then deactivate it and just install the requirements within your base environment. Um, and if it failed from the setting up the environment, that means that we're missing a few tools. So what we'll do for the, the couple that, the couple two that, uh, let's see, somehow for me installing the requirements is still going on, no error. Yeah, so it might take a little bit of time. Uh, so in that case, okay. So Andrea, why don't we wait a couple more minutes uh, for your setup to be done? And then for the other two who had difficulties with the environment, can you type in the chat what went wrong? Okay. Uh, so for that, okay, so it's, I'm still trying, trying to wrap my head around it at this point. Okay, awesome. Okay, so what what were so maybe let's backtrack a little bit. So one, um, were you able to get clone the repository? Okay, awesome. Were you able to change directories into dashboard workshop dash? Okay, awesome. Okay, so what what the what the per the purpose of the environment is so that you have a self-contained area where you can do your development. And so what's neat about having the environment set up within your local computer is that think of it as a little uh, environment or like experiment sandbox where you have your control library. So you have you have a very specific set of libraries installed. And um, within there, you can go and do your development locally. And so the advantage of having it in a, in a control sandbox is that when you want to host the Dash app on a website, then you, you can provide what specific libraries and versions you use during your sandbox stage uh, to the website hosting stage so that when you go from local to online, you don't introduce unforeseen errors with the, the online hosting option potentially giving you a different version of the package that you're using. Okay, so Windows tried Python 3 and it worked. Okay, so that worked for you, great. I might have messed up my environments at some point. Uh, and for you, it says preparing metadata error with many other errors. Uh, so did you try running pip install upgrade pip setup tools wheel? So that is, so for, for, for Ahmed, when you say preparing metadata pipe project error with many other errors, uh, did it come when you said pip install upgrade, pip install requirements, or was it during activation? It still doesn't recognize pip as a command, the second one. Yeah, so if for you it's not recognizing pip as a command, because uh, something very similar happened to me when I try to when I try to do it with the environment, I'm, I it might be to do with us doing it through Windows. What I'd recommend in that case, Dia, is to type deactivate, and then after you type deactivate, to try uh, pip install requirements, and then it should start the download. Can you tell me if that's if that that that's kind of what I ended up having to do? Because for some reason, I I had very similar issues. Might be because I'm working from Windows.
And so what's going for, for those of you who are like, I don't know why we're doing this in the first place. When we do pip install dash r requirements.txt, what we're saying is, hey, I want you to install dash 1.20, dash core 1.16, dash HTML 1.1, etc. Okay. So uh, one more temperature check. So if you haven't had a chance to please participate in the poll to let me know if you've activated it. And if you're ready to go, then the next step you should type is or do is to enter Jupyter Notebook. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't been able to get your, your environments working or your dependencies working, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to um, type the requirements, sorry, install the requirements within your base environment and then go to Jupyter Notebook and then type ready once you're ready to go. Okay, so I do see that folks are typing ready, ready, ready. Awesome, okay. So now that you've typed Jupyter Notebook, a new, a new tab should have been open with a, a local host. For you might be a different port. My port is 8080, sorry, 8888. And then in here, you're gonna see that there's a few folders. You're gonna wanna click on the notebooks folder. And then with the notebooks, there's gonna be part one and part two, click on part one. And then within part one, uh, you're gonna see that there's, there's uh, two parts to what we're gonna do. The first part is to do data exploration. And then the second part is gonna be, um, it's gonna be the, um, the components. So let's get started. All right. So for data exploration, we're going to first get spend some time getting familiar with the data. Uh, we're going to be using pandas and plotly. And also we're going to be uh, using the notion of factoring code into functions, the notion of writing a Python script. And then we're going to be working with um, uh, running or we're going to be running the script from our terminal to ensure that we recreate the same results. And then the second part is dashboard components. Uh, we will take what we built together in part one and explore the main components in a dash dashboard. So part one for the data exploration, we're going to go ahead and install uh, or ra rather import pandas as pd and plotly.express as px. And then the data is read within this URL format. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take this, um, the content of the CSV. If I go ahead and I visit the, the URL, what I have here is a CSV file that has uh, geography, time, delinquency rate, average mortgage amount, and population size. Uh, this corresponds to data from Canada, uh, where I'm from. And it's kind of difficult to parse this in raw format. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this into a pandas data frame via the read CSV function. And so what this uh, what this does is I'm going to say okay pandas or pd .read, read CSV. I'm going to pass the URL. In this case, it's going to automatically read the content of my CSV, and then I'm going to store it into a variable called data pop delmort df. So in here I have the full data frame. I'm going to go ahead and do head, just do the first few entries. And as before, you can see I have a geography column, a time column, a delinquency rate, an average mortgage amount, and a population size. And then in here, I have each of the different provinces um, on, on the, as the rows. Okay, so the first exercise is to get familiar with the table. Uh, some of the questions that we might be interested in answering are what are the relevant variables in the data? What does the range mean in median of the columns uh, delinquency rate, average mortgage amount, and population size? What is the time range and frequency of the data? And so the two methods that we use typically are the info method and the describe method. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to work with these before, what this is going to give you is a snapshot of the data frame itself, for instance, we have 330 rows indexed from zero to 329. We have a total of five columns. And then this here gives us a snapshot for the number of non-entry 
non-empty entry, sorry. So in this case, uh, out of 330 entries, we see that each and every row has 330 non-empty rows, which means there's no missing information. Other interesting information might be the type of the column. So geography and time are given as objects. So if I do that right here. So in here, geography, and let's just do actually geography. Oh, sorry. Let's just do geography. Geography. So in here, this is encoded as an object. Typically, the object represents uh, strings. Uh, time is also formatted as an object instead of a time series. And the reason for this is I'm encoding it year plus the number. Awesome. So see that it's finally ready. Okay, so for those of you who for whom it's ready, uh, just go ahead and do Jupyter Notebook. Uh, from there, once you type Jupyter Notebook in the terminal, it's gonna launch this, uh, this Jupyter um, server on your local machine, go to the notebooks folder, and then go to part one data exploration. Okay. So time in here is also encoded as an object uh, with a string that has the year and the quarter. And then the other columns in here are numeric. So delinquency rate are, is a floating type and then average mortgage amount and population size is a integer type. Okay, so, right. so from here, uh, the first question is, uh, what do you think are parameters that I might be interested in uh, evaluating? Or what are the main attributes of the data? And you don't have to type them all. You can type one or two of the ones that you that you see might get your attention. Oh, yes. So the question is, uh, what are attributes in the data that I might be interested in studying? Mm -hmm. So the numbers, yes. Another one is we can look at maybe how does the average mortgage amount varies from population size? Yes, that's a great question. Percentage, yes. So we want to take a look at things like how the delinquency rate also changes uh, over time relative to the population size. So we're going to go ahead and take those questions. Um, okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the described, ta described table now. Uh, other things that are interesting, for instance, are the average delinquency rate across all the different provinces is 0 0.44. The average mortgage amount is 22,000, no, oh, sorry, two, sorry, 221,000 uh, Canadian dollars. And then the population size is 3.61, 10 to the power of six. So now we're gonna go ahead and uh, move on to Plotly. Why? Because trying to make sense of tables alone is not necessarily intuitive. And also one can get lost in the numbers. We're gonna go ahead and jump into generating visualizations with Python and Plotly. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna go ahead and do is, and we can go ahead and do this together, is I'm gonna use px.line. I'm gonna pass the name of the data frame and then the X and Y values. So if I go ahead and run this first attempt, uh, that is going to generate this plot that is not necessarily uh, sensical. And here I see a bunch of jumps, but I have all the data uh, clustered, or rather, I have the, all the data from different provinces treated as the same. Uh, so this isn't necessarily going to work. I could change this from point to scatter. And so from point to scatter, I do have a little bit better of uh, a snapshot, but it's still not clear which province I'm looking at in here. Uh, one of the nice things about Plotly, as you can see, is that I can hover over each of the data points and I can get um, information on the time and the delinquency rate. But we still need to do a little bit more work on this plot. So we're going to go ahead and color the values by geography and add a title. So this is going to be the same plot as before. The only thing that's changed, I'm going to remove this for a bit. So this was the first plot that we saw. 
The only thing that I'm adding here is a color, a color parameter, color by geography. So when I do color geography, uh, Plotly automatically determines uh, or adds a color to the appropriate, uh, the appropriate province. In Canada, uh, this is a list of provinces. I am based in British Columbia. So let's just go ahead and do oops. And let's just do Canada. So this is all of Canada. So these are all the different provinces. I am based in British Columbia. Uh, we have Alberta uh, to the west, then Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland, and Labrador. So all of these are the different provinces that, that uh, Plotly is recognizing automatically from the data. If I go back to uh, data and I do geography, geography.unique. Uh, so these are the, the unique values found under the geography column. So what this color parameter does in Plotly is it automatically detects those unique values and it correspondingly adds the right color to each and every one of the provinces. Um, the other thing I can do is I can add a title. So in this case, I'm gonna do line plot of time and delinquency by geography. I could very easily change this to scatter plot instead. It's up to, to people's choice. So I see a question in the chat. The question is, what's the difference between Plotly and PyPlot? Uh, so, Plotly is a Python package, whereas PyPlot is, as far as I understand, a sub-module within matplotlib. Matplotlib is a different package for visualization, and I can quickly do a demo here. So if I were to do import matplotlib or pyplot as plt, so PyPlot is a sub-module within the matplotlib library, another package for visualizing. And I can do plt uh, plot. And in this case, I could generate the same plot. Uh, let's just do one. So if I were to do the same thing, I could do x value is going to be this. And, and here I want the time. The y value is going to be the following, and I want infancy rate. I could do x, y. So this is the original plot that we generated as before. If I remove the color in here, uh, this is the same plot. So these two are two different packages of generating visualizations. Um, depending on your use case, you'll use one over the other. Um, is it more recommended to use matplotlib or plotly in Python for data visualization? It depends on what you want to do, and it depends on your use case. Uh, the reason I picked plotly for the Dash workshop is because once I, I go from Jupyter Notebook to a self-contained app with my plots, plotly is designed to work with Dash. Uh, they're both part of the same, or they're, they're both built on, have very similar um, components built under the hood. Uh, so it does depend on your use case. For instance, if I wanted my plots to be, if I didn't, if I, if I didn't care about my plots being interactive and I wanted to do some, some uh, initial data exploration and I just wanna have a static plot, matplotlib does a wonderful, wonderful job. There's lots of documentation and tutorials online. Uh, there's also Seaborn as another package that we haven't explored yet. Uh, Seaborn is another wonderful package for doing data visualization. And again, there is no one over the other. It depends on your use case. When I hear someone unmute themselves, do you have a question? No. Yes? No, okay. So the, the it does depend on the use case and what you wanna do. For interactive plots that I eventually wanna put in a dashboard, Plotly is the library that I'll pick. If I wanna have something static and exploratory, if I wanna have something that I, I can, uh, I don't necessarily care about the interactivity, then Plotly, sorry, Matplotlib or Seaborn are fantastic libraries to use. Okay, uh, so let me just go back and add the color. 
All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the data. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and add, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit more code. So I think it was average mortgage amount. Okay, so if I were to comment this, uh, where's variable? And I will to put this right in here. There we go. Okay, so let's say that I wanted to generate uh, different plots. So the different variables that I have are average mortgage amount. We have delinquency rate. Uh, and I can't remember the other one. I think it was. So we had population size is the other one. So let's say that I wanted to I wanted to generate each and every one of these plots. So I can go ahead and just and just grab the value and plug it in here. Uh, but now I have to modify my code manually. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to introduce a variable, and instead of putting each and every time uh, the the variable in here, I'm just going to set y equals to variable, and then I'm going to use f strings to just add in the title of the variable name. And I'm just going to do here, so let's just do variable. And then, so that way I can just, I can just as easily do a plot about delinquency rate or a plot about population size by simply changing the value of the variable. Okay, so we're starting to get closer to factoring code a little bit. So instead of me having to write this three times, I now just write it once and I just change the name of the, or sorry, the value of the variable. Okay, so now let's say that instead of me wanting to generate line plots, let's say that I wanna generate, uh, um, I want to take a look at the distribution of the data. So in this case, I would turn to a box plot. All I have to do is do px.box, and from here, I pass, uh, in this case, I believe the variable is data frame. So data frame is just going to be the name of the variable with the data frame. The x value is going to be the geography. The y value, the delinquency rate. I'm going to color by geography again. I'm going to add a title. And as before, some of the things that might be interested in here is that um, BC, where I live, uh, seems to have, on average, a lower delinquency rate when compared to, say, New Brunswick or Nova Scotia, another province within Canada. Now, uh, things that I can do from here is I can go ahead and instead of me changing the code over and over again, I can just do delinquency and it's just do population size. And as before, notice, notice that I was very specific about the way I wrote this. If I were to write population size underscore s, I would get this uh, huge error message. And at the end, I would say here value of y is not in the name of a column. I expected one of geography, time, delinquency rate, et cetera. Just giving you a hint for the type of name I'd expect. It's just saying, hey, like I don't know what population size with lowercase s is. And as before, I can see here that Ontario seems to have the, the highest, um, on average, the highest population size. I can go back and say, so let's take a look at delinquency rate. That's delinquency rate. And I can go and take a look at average. And there it is. So BC, where I live, has the highest, um, highest housing average mortgage amount. Okay, so that's all great. Uh, I can go ahead and do a scatter plot, and we did see this a little bit before. So in here, I just do px.scatter. I pass uh, the data frame value, the y, va the y value, the x value, and the title. And as before, I kind of want to color this so that it's colored by geography. So I'm going to color this by geography. And then for the hover name, I'm going to add hover name geography as well. So if I were to add a hover name parameter, I now have um, within the, the little text box what the what the location is. In this case, the pink ones are a province name Alberta. The yellow ones are province name British Columbia. 
I could change this to be instead the population size. And then each time I hover over each and every one of these data points, I get the population size for that particular data point. So I can get, it's almost like you're adding an extra dimension to the plots. So in this case, I'm doing a scatter plot of delinquency rate versus the average mortgage amount to establish or to see if there's some kind of relationship. Um, if I don't color by geography at first, it might appear as if there is a bit of an inverse relationship. But if I color by geography, and let's say that I just want to take a look at BC, I can double click on a plot and I can see whether or not there, is, there, there might be a relationship between and in some provinces, it might be the case, but not, not at all. Okay, so that was just a little bit of a flavor for what, for what you can do with Plotly. And now I wanna show you how you can use dictionaries to access different kinds of functions. And then can you type in the chat if you have worked with a dictionary before? You can type yes, if you have, and no otherwise. I see a couple of yeses. All right, awesome. Okay, so you are familiar with the dictionary. So I can have a sample dictionary where I just have the name and then the values. I can have the values be a list or a set or a tuple or even a function. So I'm gonna be focusing on uh, accessing functions. So, uh, just as a sort of refresher, typically the way we access the values under a key is by using the name of the variable, uh, square brackets, the key name, and then that'll give us access to the values. So as before, if I were to do sample dictionary, set numbers, that'll give me the numbers. Sample dictionary, tuple numbers, that'll give me the tuple. And then lastly, if I do function sum, that is going to return a function. Uh, so that's a trick that I'm going to use for when I start refactoring my code. So if I wanted to use the function sum, I could use sum, pass a list that has the values one, two, three, but I can also use it with the dictionary as follows. So I could do uh, the name of the dictionary, square bracket, the key that has the function, and then in parentheses, I have um, the values. Now you might think, well, this is a very, very cumbersome way of accessing the sum function. I could just, I could have just written sum in here and that would have given me the same. Why are we doing this? And so the reason is because I can build a dictionary that has uh, the different kinds of plots. So I can add a keyword and then just call PX box, Keyword for violin, px violin, keyword for scatter is going to be the px scatter function, and then line is going to have px line. And so that means uh, that means that in here, instead of doing something like px px scatter, I can then have something like plot dict scatter. And uh, let's see what went wrong. Uh, I probably didn't run it. There we go, that's fine. I didn't run it. Okay, so now I can go ahead and have this, but at the same time, I can change this from scatter to line. I can do box, and that's not a very, that doesn't, that, that's not a very sensical box. So I can change here geography. So we now have geography. And so the idea behind using this as a, and I can even go as far as doing something like violin. So the idea of me using something like the dictionary is that I minimize the amount of new code I have to write. And I essentially have all the different plots that I wanna generate via this tiny little chunk of code. So from here, I can just do something like scatter. And it'd be a very sensical scatter plot. And I can just play with a few keywords, just uh, the, the name of the function, the X and Y value. And then the rest uh, is going to change accordingly. So the dictionary is going to be a, a particularly useful trick for me to use. Okay, so uh, we have a bit of an exercise. So the exercise is basically just play with the play with the play with the dictionary and see what you can generate. So if I wanted to have something like geography and geography on a very interesting plot. 
but it is one that I can generate nevertheless, but I can have something like average mortgage amount. So there it is. I have a, a violin plot of the average mortgage amount. So for instance, in BC, I seem to have a little bit of a bimodal distribution. Somewhere like Alberta, it seems like it's mostly normal distribution, normal distribution, normal distribution. But some provinces seem to have a little bit of a bimodal distribution when it comes to their average mortgage amounts. Let's take a look at the delinquency rate. Again, most provinces seem to have a bimodal distribution around the delinquency rate. And let's take a look at the population size. Uh, let's just do Fox. Yeah, so not a lot of, not a lot of, uh, it seems like the, the population doesn't seem to change a lot over the course of, of time. And I can go ahead and check this if I go, if I do line and I change this to be time. So if I go ahead and check the change in population size over the time, it seems to stay more or less stable. So the, the key, the key takeaway from here is that I can, I can build a little plotting machine by using two tools. First, I'm going to use the plotly charts. And the second tool I'm going to use is the dictionary, where I associate each keyword to a specific function. And then from here, I just have to change a couple things in order to generate a bunch of different plots. And so from here, now we can go ahead and refactor this into a function. And so what I have here is uh, the same. You've seen this piece of code before. So this is our, our, our function dictionary. And then in here, I just have, this is the same, the same chunk of code you've seen before where I have the dictionary, the keyword, dimension one, dimension two, which are both going to be parameters. Uh, the region DF is just going to be uh, the data frame that we've been working with. I'm gonna color everything by geography and I'm gonna add a hover name of time. And then in here, the only thing that I've done that's a little bit different is I want to make sure that every time I generate the type of, or sorry, that I update the chart, that it updates accordingly the type of graph, that it tells me the one, the X dimension and the Y dimension. And then uh, if I make a mistake, like let's say that instead of providing one of the keywords box, violin, scatter, or line, that it, it throws some error message at me. Um, and then if I provide a dimension that is not within the data frame, that it gives me an error message as well. So now I can go from, and let me just make sure that I run this. So now I can go from uh, simply changing a couple words. And I, I now have a function that generates, let's see. Delinquent. Oh, there we go. So I now have delinquency rate. And notice that instead of instead of uh, instead of this breaking into a, a horrible uh, string of error, I now have a tiny little chunk of code that tells me, "Hey, that's not part of the columns." Point being that it's very easy for me to now change. And you just get a bunch of different ones. And notice that when I make a mistake, it says, hey, key not found, graph type expected one of these. It's a box. So I now have one line of code that is uh, very versatile. It can generate a bunch of different plots. All right. So all that is great. I can now do things like a scatter, etc. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to show you is if you wanted to have uh, that we won't incorporate this into our um, into our dashboard, but I did want to show this to you. Within Plotly, you also have the capability of generating animated plots. And in here, notice that all I'm doing is I'm using the PX scatter. And all I'm doing in here is I'm adding two new variables, one called animation frame. I'm going to animate by time. And then the animation group is going to be the geography. So that if I wanted to see how delinquency rate changes versus average mortgage amount changes over time, I can see that, for instance, when BC started in 2012, it seemed to have a higher uh, delinquency rate. And as time went by, it both decreased the delinquency rate, but also the average mortgage amount increased. OK, so uh, just to show other things that you can do with Thoughtly. All right, so that's it for part one. 
Uh, so because we are already about an hour in, I'm wondering if people would like to take a five minute break before we move on to part two. So you can type uh, yes, yes, break, or you can type break if you wanna have a break or continue if you want to continue. Okay, so I see one person would like to continue. Continue. All right. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so now that we have learned a little bit about uh, Dash, sorry, Plotly, and generating interactive plots, and now that we have one function that generates a bunch of different plots, we're now going to talk about the dashboard components. So the four main components in a dash dashboard are a, a .py script. This is going to be your dashboard app. We typically call it app.py. We're gonna have a requirements.txt file with the Python dependencies. In this case, I've already collected them for you. Uh, these are the dependencies. We're also going to need a proc file. And again, I've also collected it for you. So the proc file is just going to have uh, this line of code right here. And then the other thing that we require is a git ignore. Uh, what the git ignore does is if in your repository, if you have things like, or if within your local environment, you have the environment file, you have uh, these Jupyter notebook check, checkpoints, etc. The git ignore is just going to make sure that those don't get added to your repository. That's all that does. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is before we get into the Dash app, we're going to talk about the anatomy of Python scripts in general, or at least at least one useful way of thinking about them. So typically, within a, Pyth a Python script, I will have some imports, and then I will have a function. And within my function, I will have things like the, the name of the function, the parameters, the type of parameter that is, and then what it returns. In this case, um, I just have a function one with parameters part one and part two that returns nothing. So if I were to if I were to play with this, uh, if I were to play with this, or if I were to package, let's say that as before we have this this chunk of code right here. Let's say that I want to package this into a script. So in here, I could package this as follows. And let me just exit the presentation mode. So I could package this as follows. I just have two packages that I need. I have one function. In this case, I will return, uh, I will return a figure. So the function, the final function is graph region with the region df. And this should be, sorry, I have the graph type, which is of type string, dimension one, which is of type string, dimension two, which is of type string. And then uh, in here, what I have is the dictionary, as you had seen it before. We initialize the function, we format it, and then the other, so that's, you've seen this before. And then the new thing that you might see is, uh, I add a main program, which means I wanna make this Python script executable. So typically how I make it executable is by adding an if underscore underscore name underscore underscore is equal to main. Then this means that if I were to execute this, then this is what I want um, the console to run. And as before, all I'm running in here is I set up the URL with the data. I read it into a CSV. I display the first few rows and then I visualize it. So that if I were to execute the cell right here, it displays the first few rows. And then in here, I have a bunch of different plots. So in here, I just generated three figures, one that generates a scatter plot of time against average mortgage amount, one that generates a violent plot of geography against mortgage amount, and one that generates scatter plot of average mortgage amount versus delinquency rate. So in here, I have three different plots. And so I can very easily run this instead of having it in here, if we go back to NV scripts, I have a base script.py. So this is my base script.py. 
So this means that I can now run this from my Jupyter notebook as follows. So I could do run bash i and b script uh, base script .py. And this is just going to generate generate three plots. Um, similarly, if I were to open up a new anaconda prompt, uh, so let's just, uh, let, let me just make sure that I'm sharing everything so that I don't end up talking about my anaconda prompt without you seeing it. Um, I don't think I need administrator actually. Let me just go back to anaconda prompt. Okay, let's just do CD documents. Okay. Notebooks, they are the NB scripts. So in this NB scripts, this are base pi, there's a base script of pi, so I could very easily do Python base script pi. And so what this is going to do is it's going to open up uh, the, the, the plots in the three different tabs. And so that means that with, with me putting my code into a .py script, I now have, and with me adding this little main pro program right here, I now have a Python script that's executable. And all this Python script does is it's going to uh, generate a new plot and it's going to open it up in a new tab. That's it. Now, uh, in terms of what what's wrong with this with the plots being laid out this way uh, for one if i had more than two plots let's say that i wanted to generate each and every possible combination um i now have a problem because one i have to add each and every one of the figures each time and then i have to show them and then when i run the script it's going to open up a new tab and so if i wanted to look at them at the first time i mean i could i could maybe do something like like uh, minimize it, but it's hard to read in general. So it's not a great it's not a great way to present it, and it's not a very nice user experience. So we're going to introduce the app machinery. So the app.py script is just a Python script that's the, responsible for deploying the app. It's just going to be a .py script with additional machinery. So the additional machinery is going to contain mostly the same regular uh, .py script plus a few new items. So we're going to add uh, the dash library imports. Other things that we can add include the external style sheets. If you have worked with HTML or CSS before, this is exactly what I'm referring to. If you haven't worked with this before, it's just um, uh, external style sheets are just a way to give some styling to your dashboard without you needing to do a lot of, a lot of trickery behind the scenes. We're going to initialize our app. Uh, we're going to add an app layout, and we are going to add decorator callbacks. And I get, I'll get into these, the, each and every one of these uh, components one by one. So the dash library imports. So you've seen me doing things like import pandas SPD. You've seen me do things like import plotly dot express as px. So we're going to do the same for dash. So some of the things that we're going to add are dash. Uh, we're going to add dash core components with the alias DCC. We're going to add dash HTML components with the alias HTML. And then we're going to add from dash dot dependencies input and output. And so these two in particular are what's going to make it possible for me to create an interactive dashboard. The external uh, style sheets. Again, so because these are rendered in the web browser with CSS and JavaScript, uh, typically, what's going to happen once the page load, loads is that the dash serves a small HTML template that includes references to the CSS and JavaScript required to render the application. So some of these style sheets uh, you can use in your dashboard, similar to how you use them in your website. Uh, the app initialization, all I'm doing is I'm calling dash dot dash. In this case, I'm going to pass name, uh, the external style sheets. And then I'm going to initialize the server by doing app.server. From here, I'm going to set up a layout. And we're going to play a little bit more with this layout. Uh, because this isn't a fixed, you get to decide how, the, how your dashboard is going to be laid out. I'll get to that in a little bit. But all I'm doing is I'm saying HTML.diff. 
uh, this div is very similar to the div that we are talking about when we we are talking about web development. It's just a section within within our our dashboard. And then the callbacks. Uh, so these are functions that are automatically called by Dash whenever an input's components property changes. So this these callbacks are what make it so that I can have interactivity within my dashboard. Namely, if I click on a drop down menu and I say, hey, I want you to switch plus, I want you to plot the box plot instead. The callback is what makes it possible for me to go from clicking on something to the to the plot updating. So all that's going, this particular callback that I'm going to be using has uh, two main components, an output and an input. The output has two main parameters, the graph ID um, and the output, which is a figure, or rather the format. And then input is going to have a value ID and then a value. And then right after the decorator, we have a function. The function is typically dedicated to updating the figure itself. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the full script. So, uh, so this you have seen before. So these are our imports. We're gonna have a little bit of a reading data section. And then within the app section, I have the, st the, the style sheets, initializing the app, the layout, and then the callback. And then at the very bottom, we have the, the main program. And all the main program does is app.runserver. If you've worked with Flask, uh, this is a very, very similar format as with Flask apps. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn our plotting script into an app using Dash. So as before, all our plotting script had were the pandas and plotly functions. The, the master function that generates a bunch of different plots and then the main program. So in here, we're gonna have something similar except a few things are gonna change. So the main program is gonna turn into uh, app.runserver. So we have uh, our pandas import or poly import. We have the dash imports. Here's our function. But it, before, remember we used to have, we used to read the data inside main. This time we're gonna move this outside main, and we're gonna put it right after our function. So you should be a little bit familiar with this. So this URL just contains the CSV that I showed you before. And then uh, I read the content of that CSV into a pandas data frame. And then here is where the app comes in. So I have this external style sheets. I initialize the app. And in this case, um, I have here a layout. So in this layout, I have one div. It says uh, H1 or header one is housing graphs and it just has a, a drop down menu. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go here where it says uh, so the directory is notebooks and then NB scripts. And in here, there's an app.py. So, I'm going to go ahead and grab this app layout. Or, what I'm going to ask you to do rather for the next few exercises is that you take uh, the content of this app in this cell and then just bring it onto app.py and then save it and then in here as before i have the imports the graph reading of the data the app section and in here i just have a division a, a, a div section with a, a header one and a drop down and then from here all i have to do is go python from the terminal go python app.py and so that is going to go ahead and start the app. It says dash is running on. So you're going to go ahead and copy whatever address it gives you. And here's our app. So right now it's not very interesting. There's not a lot of stuff going on. Right now, all my app does is it has a, a division or rather a div section with a header one and a drop down. And so for me to update the app, all I have to go is all I have to do is go back to app.py. So let's say that I want to call this a drop down menu instead of housing graphs. I save that. And all I have to do is um, refresh. And now it says drop down menu. And I have the different provinces in here. So that's pretty neat because, as before, remember, all we did was we just did Python based script. And we're going to run our app the same way, just do Python app.py. We can make changes within our app. And then it's going to update right here. Now, 
Uh, the next point I want to talk about is choosing your layout before you code. And the reason for that is because typically we're going to build the layout using a few HTML elements. And within Python, it can sometimes get a little bit hairy to nest or put the different elements as we want them. So it's typically very, very useful for you to decide what you want and implement it rather than brainstorm with your code um, and see what you get. Because oftentimes when you do it the second way where you're like, I don't know what I want to code, I'm just going to play with things. It's very easy to bring an error message um, and it's very easy to bring a bug and it's, it's painful to fix. So first we pick our layout. And so one of the things that I'm, I'll bring to your attention is for header one, header two, etc. cetera, uh, this isn't very complicated. I just pick the header one and in quotation marks, the name, but the dropdown is a little bit different. And for instance, there's a few new things that are going on. There's an ID. Uh, this ID is going to be very, very important when we incorporate the decorators. And then there's um, the options. And notice that in here, the structure is label and value. In this case, I'm picking these from the geography column. I could pick, for instance, the time column, and I save this, and I refresh this, and now the, the time ones are now the quarters. I have 2012 Q3 all the way to 2020 Q3. So I can just go ahead and change this, but let's say that I type here geography instead of time and geography with lowercase. I now have a prompt says the site can't be reached. So let's just go and see what happened here. So nothing happened here. It looks like it's still working. But it is fairly, notice how as soon as I made just one tiny little mistake, my app broke. Uh, let's see, something happened here. Nope, nothing happened here. Oh, it's still loading. Did I break anything else? I did not. So let me just go ahead and open it up again. Okay, let me kill it and let me try again. Ah, there it is. I have a key error geography. All right, so let's try it again. Okay, so going back to this, this is why picking the the outline before matters because you wanna you wanna avoid entering into this uh, messy code where you're not sure what's going on. So what I'm gonna recommend or what I'm doing is to use diagram generating software. In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, generate, continue. And I think I have it under here. There we go. So I, I just have here a little bit of code, or sorry, a little bit of a few diagrams for what I would like to generate. And uh, this is sort of the final product. But let's say, so for this part, the first thing I have here is I have a heading. I have a heading, and then I just have a drop down. So for drop down, I'm just going to use the following. So this is a heading, and then I just have like a little thing that represents this is a drop down. Drop down. So that's 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 my very first uh, version. Just a drop down menu. Now, if I want to generate something, uh, something like a drop down menu in a plot. So, in that case, we're going to add the drop down menu. So, as before, so let's say that I want to add a drop down menu that has the different types of plots instead of just the, the geography name. So, in this case, I'm going to change my layout to have um, the div as before. We're going to have different kinds of plots. I'm going to add a drop down menu. The ID is going to be the graph type. And then the options are just going to be, I have uh, three different labels, scatter plot, line plot, box plot. And then the value is just going to be the keywords for the dictionary. So I'm just going to go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and grab this and then put it in the layout. And you're welcome to do this along with me. And you can just copy the code and grab it. And then I have a, a menu or a, a drop drop down with different kinds of plots. Okay, 
So the next piece is a plot that changes based on the plot type. So now in here, the next piece I want to have is I want to have a plot right here. So this is just a plot. And the heading is going to be different kinds. Okay, so now what I want to do with this is I want to say, hey, like if I pick a scatter plot, I want you to generate a scatter plot. If I say box plot, I want you to generate a box plot. So uh, remember, the next thing is uh, there's, there's uh, first I have DCC dropdown and I have a graph type ID. I'm going to add one more component and I'm going to add a, an ID called graph render. So these IDs are going to be very important for me to make things work because the next piece within that layout is to add the callback and the update figure function. So in this case, I'm gonna add app callback. Output is going to be the graph render and it's gonna be a figure. And then the input is gonna be a graph type. So it's very, very important for me to keep in mind those IDs and then it's gonna be a value. And then from here, I just have a function that's called update figure zero. It's gonna take just as input the selected graph and then I'm going to take uh, my data frame to be the same object that I generated before. Graph region is a function that you've seen me use before. This is this function right here. I'm going to take that data frame as input. I'm going to take selected graph. And then I'm just going to visualize geography against, uh, against um, the average mortgage amount. So you're welcome to just copy this chunk of code and then just bring it onto app.py, save it. And then let's refresh. And now in here, I should see uh, da, 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 what went wrong. So because I'm returning something. Oh, I think it's because I'm returning something. Um, Oh, it's because I'm showing it. That makes sense. Okay, so let's make let's let's fix two things. So first, we don't want to show the figure; we want to return it. So if we show it, it's going to do that thing where it just it just brings them to the next one. Yeah. So we had a non error. Okay. So thanks to be sure that you don't do. Make sure that that your function returns fake, and that this returns fake as well. And so now in here, what I have is I have a, a drop down menu. When I change to violin plot, I have a violin plot of average mortgage amount versus geography. When I switch to box plot, it switches to box plot automatically. So the key components here were one, the drop down menu with the graph type ID, and then DCC graph is just the next element. And notice that I could switch these two around if I wanted to have. I mean, this, it wouldn't make a lot of sense, but just to show you that this is about layout. I could have this in here. So put the, the graph before the drop down menu. And then if I save this, I'm going to have uh, my, my plot before and then my violin, sorry, my plot at the top and then my drop down menu at the bottom. So notice how it really does matter to choose which which layout to you want to work on, but notice later how easy it is to sort of move things around once you're happy with, with the layout. For me, I think it's a little bit more intuitive to have the drop down menu at the top. Sorry, that's not where I need to go. To have the drop down menu at the top and then the plot at the bottom. Okay, so, uh, so now let's do the following. So now let's say that instead of having one plot, Let's say that I want to have two plots. Let's say that I want to have a drop down menu that updates two plots. So that's my layout now. And there might be a question. Okay, so as before, uh, we're going to have the divs. And notice that in here, I am now adding two nested divs in here. So I have one that says uh, that has the, the heading one. I have the drop down, and in this case, the drop down that I'm adding has the province as opposed to the, the graph type. So we're going to incorporate that at the end. And then the, the next one is going to have uh, one div, and then inside that div, there's two nested divs. So the first one is going to have uh, the graph type mortgage, 
And then the second one is going to have the graph, graph time delinquency. So notice how this looks a little bit different. So in here, I have the title, the drop down, and then two plots. And then the way it looks like in here is I have, I have one diff, one diff that has the title and then the drop down, and then another div that has uh, one div for the plot, or sorry, one one div for the for the left hand side plot, and then one more div for the right hand side plot. And notice how each of these has a unique ID. We're gonna break the IDs in a bit so you see what that looks like. And we're gonna have uh, we're now gonna have. Uh, two functions and two callbacks. So the first one is going to update a uh, graph, graph time mortgage. So that one is going to be for this first diff. And all I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, so filter DF, I'm just going to select one of the province that I care about. In this case, is one of my unique geography values. And then it's going to visualize the average mortgage amount. And then the second plot, the second function is pretty much the same, except instead of doing average mortgage amount, it's going to plot the delinquency rate. So as before, you're welcome to just grab this chunk of code and then bring it onto here and just copy and paste it. And then let's update it. So now it updates and I can now select uh, a province. I can select a province and then it updates is it updating the province in here? Yes, it is. So I now have here Quebec and Quebec. If I pick British Columbia, where I live. Uh, so this is the average mortgage amount. So what we're seeing here for the, the province where I'm from, for instance, is that the average mortgage amount started off around the 300,000. And then uh, eight years later is about almost 420,000. It's almost 100K, over 100K increase. But then the delinquency rate, on the other hand, uh, it decreased. We started off in 2012 with 0 0.4. And then at the end of Q3, we had 0 0.19. So that's like half. So point B here is we go ahead and pick our layout. And then the way these look is just a, a plug and play kind of thing. You can think, think of each of these as a block. And then to do the update, uh, you just set up a little function. Typically, what I like to do is setting up a master function so that it's fairly easy. All I have to do here is add an update figure function with the parameters that I care about. But let's break things now. Let's say that, so I have my ID here called graph time mortgage, and I have graph time mortgage. Let's let's just say that I, I'm, I'm cleaning my code and I sometimes somehow mess up the name. And now instead of graph time mortgage, I call it graph time. So now I have an error message. It says ID not found. It's gonna say ID not found. I don't have my error messages in here. And it's very easy to just feel like discarding these like oh i don't care about this and then be like oh why why doesn't my thing work like it, it told you why it doesn't work but it just it just tells you in this like little error message so it's it's an exercise to get familiar to interpreting error messages uh, within the python environment and the dashboard environment and here it says attempting to connect a callback output to component graph time but no components with that id exist in the layout so again we have to go back to our layout and say hey actually yeah you know what i don't i don't have i don't have that so the, uh, that's why these ids are super super important uh similar to this id right here notice that in this case the input for both is the province if i mess up that and instead i just call it geography just call it geography and i update that it says ID not found in layout. So again, it points, it says, hey, like you have a geography ID somewhere that it's not used anywhere. So it can get a little bit, uh, sometimes it can take some time to, to get familiar with it, but uh, once you update it or you get familiar, all you know is that what matters is make sure that whatever is your input ID, that you match that correctly, whatever is your output ID, typically the figure or the graph, that you, you match those correctly. Okay, so uh, let's add a little bit more of a, a complex one. So let's say that now instead, I just wanna have, instead of having two plots, because I find, I mean, at the end of the day, this is just like a line chart for a region. 
let's just do three top down menus. One is going to be for the, the X variable, one for the Y variable, and then we're going to add a checkbox for the graph type. And then in here, I'm going to have either a scatter plot, a line plot, a box plot, or a violin plot. So the code, uh, I'm adding a couple more things. I'm adding a text align to center my title. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and add, and this should be Canada. Okay. And then I'm going to add a few more things. So notice in here, I now have um, one diff. And inside that div, I have two drop downs, and then I have one checklist. And then outside that div, I have uh, the graph itself. So in this case, the first drop down is going to contain the uh, the parameter. In this case, I'm going to pick either geography, time, population size, delinquency rate, or average mortgage amount. And then that would be the x-axis column. The y-axis column, I'm going to be, I'm going to put, sorry, population size, delinquency rate, or average mortgage amount. And then for the checklist, I'm going to pick one of violin plot, box plot, scatter plot, or line plot. And then at the end, all I want is an indicator graphic. And so the only thing that's going to be different is I now have the same as before, a callback. And notice that I can add multiple inputs. So this means I don't have to generate a bunch of different functions. I can just have one function with the output, which is my figure. And then the input is going to be the graph type, the x-axis column, the y-axis column. And all I have to do is add them to my function. So as before, I have here uh, the filter DF graph region, selected graph, x-axis, and y-axis. And if I go back to this graph region, all I'm doing is I'm filling in the parameters of this function. So as an exercise, you're welcome to go and grab all of this and then put it into the app. And I usually start editing from app layout. So let's go ahead and save this. And let's, and there it is. So now uh, a, a few things that are different now. I have, let's see, I want to visualize the time and I want to make it a scatter plot instead of a violin plot. So I now have a scatter plot. And let's just do it a line chart. So that way I can generate all the different visualizations uh, as before. So let's just do geography. So I can I can now see the, the distribution of the average mortgage amount per province, and I can change it to population size, delinquency rate, et cetera. I can change this to violin plot, so on and so forth. And if I wanted to do something like a scatter plot between uh, so let's just do population size versus average mortgage amount. And we do see that those, uh, yeah, so this uh, Ontario seems to have the highest population size. So the, the, these are all the different clusters separated. Um, but I can go ahead and visualize these. And if I want to take a look at, let's say, delinquency rate versus delinquency rate, that should be a perfect straight line. Average mortgage amount versus delinquency rate. It might seem as if I have an inverse relationship. But if I take a look at each of the provinces, there might be some variation within each. Okay. So now that you have learned or have, have seen uh, sort of the insides and outs of playing with your dashboard, the really the, the key to, the, the key takeaway home, or sorry, the key take home message is at the end of the day, a dash app is just a Python script. And the Python script uh, has, or the Dash app is a, a Python script with just a little bit of additional machinery. Uh, some of that additional machinery are the Dash imports. And then the other piece of additional machinery includes the style sheets, initializing the app, and then setting up a layout uh, to decide where what goes where within the app itself. And then the other key component uh, that's that's part of a Dash app, if you want to have that interactivity, is the callback decorator, where all I'm doing is I have a function, and then the callback decorator is what makes it precisely possible for me to go from just clicking on a menu to updating the app itself. Uh, so this decorator is precisely what makes that happen. The important thing to keep in mind about the decorator is that you have to make sure that whatever you pick as your ID, for your input, 
has to be the same, sorry, for your output. In this case, uh, that would be this one right here, indicator graphic. You have to make sure that the ID matches, otherwise you're going to get an error message or a bug or the plot won't render. And then the only thing that's going to happen in the main program is they're gonna have, all you have to do is do app.runserver, debug true. And then you have your app hosted uh, locally. Now, the last piece is, okay, so what if, what if I want to go from local to hosted somewhere online? And so the first thing that's very important to, to, to keep in track here, or the, the, the main three things that are very important to have are a proc file, a requirements.txt, and a git ignore. And also to have your, your, um, your app hosted there. So typically uh, what I've done to help you with this is, oh, sorry, is, um, uh, da, 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 is I have created this uh, as a template, which means from here, you can just go ahead and do use this template and then put it under your repository. So I'm gonna make this dash app test. I'm gonna make it public. I can create the repository from template and I set it as a template precisely to make it a little bit easier for you to, to upload. But now this is under my own, own account. And then from here, all I had to do, or all I would have to do is to add app.py. Um, and then uh, let's just do it together actually. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up this with GitHub. Oh. All right, so uh, again, so, so going back. So in here, I have this uh, repository called dashboard prep that has a git ignore and it has a proc file and it has a requirements.txt. And I've made it so that uh, all, of, all of that you saw working here, uh, the dependencies are as as I outlined them here. So in here, I've set this as a template. So all you can all you have to do is press use this template. You give it a name, a description if you want, and then you press create repository from template. And then from there, uh, let's just go repositories dash app test. So from here, I now have this under my own GitHub repository. From there, you clone the repository onto your local computer. I use GitHub Desktop, but if you have a different, you can also do it manually if you prefer, or you can use um, uh, Git Kraken or any other GitHub manager. And then from here, all we have to do is, um, let's just do, so you can test. And there's not going to be anything. So we want to make sure that we add the app. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab it some documents, GitHub. I have it right here. I'm just going to copy and paste it as it is. So it's notebooks and be scripts app. I'm going to copy. Dash app test. I'm going to paste it. And then I'm going to do git add. And now I'm very comfortable doing git add. What did it? Why didn't it work? Uh, Oh, and I don't have this. Okay, I'm going to do it from my, um, I don't have, so I'm going to do it from here because I don't have, uh, I don't have set up the SSH credentials. Okay, so all I've done is I've, if I, is, is I've pushed app.py to my repository. That's all I've done. So this GitHub repository right here as you have it, can now be used to deploy the content of your app um, on an online server. You can pick something like Heroku apps. And because it is initialized as a Git repository, all you have to do is, um, let's see. I always have to look up the tutorial for how to host on Heroku. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll look that, that up for you because I don't know the steps by heart. 
But because this is initialized as a Git repository, that means that you can set up a remote to Heroku or any other online server, and then just push the changes onto that server. And then the app is hosted online. So just to show you what it looks like, I think I have it under dashboardheroku.com. Uh, oh, I really wish I don't remember my passwords. Point being, I'll, I'll, I'll look up that tutorial and I'll share it with you because I don't remember the steps. But basically, once you add your app.py to the GitHub repository and you have your gitignore, your profile, and your requirements, then you can initialize this repository under Heroku or under other Git repository that has um, online server options enabled. You can push the results and then you'll have an app hosted online. And the question is, is it working on Netlify? I don't know, I have not worked with this before. It's worth checking. I'll, I'll look up an article or two for hosting on a different server other than Heroku. But um, that's it. Uh, this is how you go from, from just to do a, a, a recap again. So we started off with our data exploration where we had a little bit of data. We explore the data set. Um, the reason I did these steps in, instead of going straight into visualizing is because um, as a sort of a magician trick. Uh, so this material, it was co-designed with Han Tong. Uh, who is also based in Vancouver. And we spent a lot of time uh, cleaning up and curating the data so that it was as easy as, as easy as possible for us to visualize. We still did the check to show you that there isn't any missing information. The general rule of thumb is once you go into visualizing, you wanna make sure that your data is clean and ready to go. Typically by the time you're building a dashboard, uh, you've already gone through the process of taking a look at the data, evaluating where the, the missing information is, deciding whether you want to impute or remove that missing information to identifying your key features. So uh, a lot of the reasons why this worked so seamlessly is because we spent a lot of time before this making sure that we had a curated data set for us to use during the workshop. Typically when you're dealing with a real data set, you might look, find that the data is messy and ugly and there's a lot of character cleanup to do. So before you go into visualizing, you always wanna make sure that you do that, that cleanup first. And then once we've done that cleanup, what we did is we did a few interactive visualizations. Um, and then we, the trick, the one trick that we did use is uh, we used a dictionary and we built a master function. Depending on the nature of your data, a master function might not be enough. You might need to have your things broken down by multiple functions. In this case, I just used one master function because it was fairly easy for me to just generate different plots with Plotly. And in this case, the data is simple enough that I can get away with just a scatter plot, a line plot, and a box plot. But if your data is more complicated, you might want to have more functions. Then from there, the next step is to bring those functions into a script with the imports. And then uh, from there, what I recommend is that you have your plotting function separate. And then for your callbacks, just have an update figure function in the callback. Otherwise, it, you can do it instead of having it right here. You can, you can just put the whole thing and then put the callback. I find this method nicer and cleaner if uh, just because I know that this is just part of the app, it's easier for me to go back and forth as opposed to trying to do it all at once, but it's up to you. You're more than welcome to just plug the full function in here. Just make sure that you have all your input parameters ready to go. Um, and then from there, the other thing that we chatted about that's very important is that choose how you want to design your dashboard prior to actually developing. Uh, just because as you can see here, all I had here was three menus, sorry, two drop down menus in a, in a checkbox and a plot. And it still looks a little bit hairy. If like, I feel comfortable looking at this now because I spent a lot of time plugging and playing with the different components. But if you're doing this from scratch, uh, things that you want to avoid are brainstorming with your code and deciding at the same time as you code, uh, because it's very easy to introduce a mistake. It's very easy to introduce a bug. So just as a nice cleanup check, decide the, the layout to start with simpler layouts and then build on top of those. And then just test, iterate and see until, until you're happy with, with, with your outline. Uh, so I'll stop the share. And I see that we still have a couple more minutes for questions. So I'll open it up for questions. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. You did a great job and a nice summary. Uh, if anyone has question, please don't hesitate to, uh, to unmute yourself or just leave the question in the chat. And I'll look up on the meantime if you can host on, on Netlify. Uh, yeah, uh, it could be, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Added one for Heroku, which is typically the environment people use for playing. Uh, oh, look, there's one for Net. It looks like there is one for Netlify. Um, it looks like it is possible. Yes, it looks like it is possible. It's possible? Yeah. So I'll just add the tutorial for folks to, to have as reference. Yes. And yes. And it, it is also connected to a GitHub repository. So as, as long as you use the template that I gave you, or you can create your own template. Like I'll, I just created a template to make it easier for you, but you're also welcome to, to, to have your own GitHub. But as, as long as you have the content of your, your repository, so the content of your repo should have an app.py with your script, mm -hmm. a requirements.txt, a proc file, and then the git ignore. As long as you have a repository, it's also compatible this way with Netlify. So. You should be good to go. Yeah, thank you for sharing this with us. Um, yeah, I think you are done with questions, maybe. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, thank you again, Lola, for your time and for your contribution. Uh, thank you all for attending this session. Uh, we'll share later the recording video on the YouTube on, uh, on YouTube. Okay, I will share with you the link uh, now of our YouTube channel in the chat. Um, and that's it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.